When Aston Martin came back to Formula One, they wanted to win. Their first two seasons were a struggle, but in 2023, they've taken a giant leap forward. Please welcome back to the Formula One podium for the 99th time, Fernando Alonso, who weaves across the line and celebrates a dream debut with Aston Martin. Yes, what you have done, guys. I'm so proud of you. Dan Fallows getting a pat on the back. And congratulations from Mike Crack, the team principal. It's Dan Fallows and his technical team that have built a car that might just make people think that Alonso, for once, has chosen the right team to go to at the right time. Night and day is how technical director Dan Fallows describes the difference between this year's car and its predecessor. That's why Aston Martin are, in his own words, exceeding expectations. They've stunned the rest of the grid by securing three podiums from the opening three races of 2023. And Fallows admits their progress has impressed him too. You sort of imagine that people do things not in a correct way or they're slightly behind or some of the technology is slightly behind. But what I was really surprised about is the talent and just the, the level that people are operating at. Who knows what makes a team win races and championships. But I think, you know, if one of those ingredients is a lot of passionate, talented people who are working hard, well, this team absolutely has it. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Clarkson, and this is F1 Beyond the Grid. Aston Martin are the surprise package of the Formula One season so far. Podiums for Alonso, valuable points for Lance Stroll. They've shaken up the top order. So what's the story behind their remarkable turnaround? Technical director Dan Fallows is one of the main characters in this tale. He began his career as one of Jaguar's aerodynamic engineers in 2002, before joining Red Bull four years later. Under the stewardship of Adrian Newey, one of the greatest F1 designers of all time, Fallows played his part in the team's most triumphant period. From 2010 to 2013, Sebastian Vettel and Red Bull won four world championships in a row. Fallows was then promoted to head of aerodynamics, and while they continued to win races, the rest of the decade was dominated by Mercedes. He left the Milton Keynes team halfway through 2021, but his work helped Max Verstappen seal his first world title. Silverstone became Dan's new home in 2022 as he moved to Aston Martin. They finished seventh in last year's constructors' standings, but the future looks much brighter. Dan tells me why the current car is so much better than last year's. We discuss where his interest in aerodynamics came from, his musical passions outside of Formula One, and working with some of the greatest drivers in recent times. Plus, we find out why he describes Fernando Alonso as a Tasmanian devil and why team owner Lawrence Stroll is much more than just the money man. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Dan, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for your time, first of all. Now, we're talking in the unusually long gap between the Australian and Azerbaijan Grand Prix. What kind of opportunities does this break give you and the, the team? Well, I suppose it does give us an opportunity to take stock of the first three races. It's been quite an energetic start to the season. I suppose that's <laughs> one way of describing it. And uh, it gives us a chance to sort of draw breath, um, particularly the race team, uh, to come back, you know, regroup, make sure all the parts on the car are, are up to spec. We've got enough parts ready for the next race into Baku. But yeah, I think now, particularly as we've had a, a good start to the season for us, we're all very keen to sort of get back to racing again in Baku. Is this unprecedented? Because during the summer break, all the factories have to close. And then when we get a decent break over the winter, everyone's frantically building new cars. Whereas the car's been built, you're allowed in to work. In your career, in, or certainly for 10 years, have you faced anything like this break? No, not really. I suppose it, it's most similar to when we have the, the summer shutdowns. I remember before they were introduced that uh, there was a certain amount of consternation about what was going to happen when we introduced the summer shutdown. The difference being here, obviously, that we, we have a break between races, but we're, we're still working. Whereas in the summer shutdown, you have that sort of unique opportunity to turn your phone off and actually relax. Whereas here, we're still going hell for leather, trying to get developments ready for the car. And is all the focus here at Silverstone on the AMR23? Or have you used the break to get some of the groundwork done on, on next year's car? Now we're, we're very much focused on this car. I mean, unless something radically changes in the next couple of months, there aren't going to be any big rule changes for next year. So this car is 
is going to be uh, our, our main focus for an amount of time. And then we'll obviously look at, you know, AMR24 for later in the year. We are keen to make sure that, you know, even though we've made a good step this year, that we don't sort of then, you know, either, well, I wouldn't say slack off, we're definitely not going to slack off. But we, we're very keen to make sure that we keep up the development, because I think that's the other part of the sort of puzzle, if you like, in terms of making a good car. It's also being able to keep up that development race in the year. So this is a a good opportunity for us to sort of stick with AMR23 and see what we can make with it. And what about the new factory? You can't avoid it as you drive towards Silverstone. It's huge. Has the migration from the old factory to the new factory started? Yeah, we have started. We've started moving some infrastructure over there. Um, We're due to be moving in sort of sometime in the beginning of May. And that will be, you know, the main DO. A lot of the offices will then be filled at that kind of time. The progress after that will be in moving some of the manufacturing parts of the, the company over to the new factory. It's an incredible facility, as you can see when you when you drive in every morning. But really how it works, we'll, we'll only really see until we move in. But I mean, I can tell you, everybody's incredibly excited about it, as you can imagine. Well, look, what about the season so far? Three consecutive podiums for Fernando Alonso, a sixth and a fourth for Lance Stroll. Have you exceeded your expectations? Yes, I think we probably have exceeded our expectations in in the respect that I think we were hoping for a big step. We were definitely hoping that we could challenge the likes of you know Mercedes and Ferrari. To be where we are now, I think, is probably more than we could have ever dreamed. But as I say, the most important thing for us is to make that a kind of sustainable gain in performance. You know, we don't want this to be a, a flash in the pan or you know, to have this sort of being the one year where we actually made a step forward and then you know, we just sort of slink back off to the midfield again. We want this to be the start of something which is a, a journey for us. So I'm absolutely delighted that we are in the position we are after three races, but we absolutely can't underestimate how strong our competitors are in this area of the, the F1 field. And it's going to take a gargantuan effort on our part to to keep in this position and to make that sustainable over a number of years. And really, that's the that's what this project is all about. It's all about trying to make that sustainable improvement and then gradually build our way up to you know, challenging for race wins and, and titles. Do you think the likes of Mercedes and Ferrari have underperformed so far this year? I'm not sure they've underperformed in that they've certainly made, I think, a tangible step since last year. It may be not the step they were hoping for, but um, I think it is a reasonable season development for them. I think the problem is that because Red Bull were clearly the the team to beat and were some amount out in front, they both needed, as everybody did really, to make a, a bigger step than you otherwise would do during a kind of season's worth of development. So they may be disappointed from that point of view, but I don't think it's fair to say they've underperformed. I think everybody has certainly improved. It's just that, uh, unfortunately, so have Red Bull. So that's uh, made their job a little bit harder, I think. And you've already scored more points this year than the team did last year. Are you still looking at the points count or is it all about podium positions for you? Very famously, our strategy engineer looked at the percentage of the points we'd made last year in the first two races. So he sort of very diligently reported that as we've made, you know, 47% of the points we made last year or whatever it was. But now we've exceeded that. Obviously, he doesn't doesn't do that anymore. But... uh, we are clearly aware of our position relative to the others. I think the, the points count itself is it's gratifying to, to now have more than we did last year. This for us is going to be a target going forward. So whatever we have managed to achieve this year is something that we then have to strive to beat next year. You said at the launch that 95% of this car is new compared to last year. How's that translated into lap time? In what areas is this car better than the 22 car? I mean, it is it is better in almost every aspect, really. You know, we had an opportunity last year to sort of look over the, the entire car. I actually don't think AMR 22 was a bad car in any respects, particularly once we developed it during the year. But there were, there were several things that were not in the way that the team would have liked, you know, because for various reasons, there were two aerodynamic concepts, which meant that a lot of the kind of internal packaging, a lot of the engineering design that would have gone into a, a car normally had to be sort of curtailed to some extent and that meant the car just wasn't what it had the potential to be I think as a as a brand new concept for a new set of regulations so this is probably really the car that AMI 22 should have been or certainly a development on that one of the things we managed to do last year was to sort of look at the whole car from nose to tail and say what can we improve and what can we do and I think that's it's a testament to the, the sort of talent and commitment of the people who who are here and some of whom have been here for many years that given the opportunity to take that sort of overview of the car and say, okay, let's critically analyse what could we do if we had the time, if we were you know, able to engineer it in a, in a better way over a longer period of time, what could we do? 
And the result is the car we have now. And it's, from my point of view, night and day better compared to MR22. All of those things translate into lap time. It's not just the aero package or the, the visible surfaces, all of these things under the skin, which make the car, as far as I'm concerned, what it could have been. And if you look at the qualifying gap between you and Red Bull, it's come down at each race. I think it was 0.4 in Melbourne. Was that track specific? Was that updates? Was that you understanding the car better? How would you explain how it's getting closer? I think it's difficult to look at relative performance to other teams, even over the course of three races, because as you can see, it is very variable depending on track. I think also it depends what you mean by relative performance as well, because we know that qualifying performance is you know, down to the one lap in, in Q3. It can be related to tyre preparation, whether there are windy conditions or not, you know, and then the characteristics of any particular circuit. So there's that. And if you're looking at relative performance in races, then there may be many things that are going on in Australia. It was obviously quite an interesting race for many, many <laughs> aspects. So actually picking out the relative performance of people is, is a very difficult business. So I, I wouldn't say that it's a very clear at the moment where the pecking order is. We have been, I think, genuinely the second quickest car over the you know, at least two or of the three races that we've we've seen so far, which is great. But where we sit relative to Red Bull, I doubt has changed very much. If it has, it's probably just because we've understood the car a little bit more, which does happen. You know, if you don't you don't necessarily have to put updates to the car to make it go faster. You just improve the setup, the drivers get used to it, the feedback gets more specific and, and you evolve the car that way. What aspect of this car are you most proud of? Well, actually, it's not really any kind of physical aspect of the car. What I'm most proud of is the fact that we took a, a team of people that have traditionally produced very good cars for the budget that they had. And we've we've managed to make small changes to working practices or small changes to the approach to develop the car. And we've taken essentially the same team of people who, for various reasons, did produce a car that was, was disappointing in terms of performance. And then a year later, we have something which is now the sort of talk of the paddock. I think that's probably the most um, thing I'm most proud of is is that team effort that's come from this group of people that have already been here. I mean, it's one of the things that I found when I got here was that it's an incredibly passionate team, you know, incredibly knowledgeable group of people and people who've, some of whom have stuck through this team through thick and thin, you know, they've seen some incredible changes and um, some real lows, I think, as well. What did you expect when you came here? Because you've, you've been in senior positions at Red Bull for, what, more than 15 years. This team has a reputation for being thrifty, for being small, I mean, what were your expectations? I mean, honestly, I thought the, I, I knew it would be smaller, but actually now because of the, you know, there's a fairly sort of aggressive growth strategy for this team, a lot of which had happened before I got here. So there are a, a lot of people in place compared to what I'm used to as well. So that wasn't necessarily true, but I, I did expect it to be smaller, I think. But also I think inevitably, maybe it's a slight arrogance about coming from a team that is at the you know, the front of the grid that you sort of imagine that people do things not in a correct way or they're slightly behind or some of the technology is slightly behind. And there are definitely things that we can still do better. But what I was really surprised about is the talent, the overall level of, and just the, the level that people are operating at. You know, it is no different from a top team. So, you know, the, the ingredients of what makes a team, well, that's a, I mean, it's a mystery. Who knows what makes a team win races and championships? But but I think, you know, if one of those ingredients is a lot of passionate, talented people who are working hard, well, this team absolutely has it. That's something I should have expected because I think their past performance has, has shown that they can compete at, you know, at quite an extraordinary level, really, given their, their budgetary situation. But I think that was a shock, to be honest. You know, a really, really pleasant surprise, as you can imagine. As technical director of Aston Martin... Dan definitely knows a thing or two about planning, precision and expert organisation. And if there's one area of our lives where we probably all need a little extra help in that department, it's almost certainly where meal planning is concerned. If you found yourself stuck in a rut, whipping up the same dishes for dinner week after week, HelloFresh is on hand to take the hassle out of mealtimes by delivering farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients that are delivered right to your doorstep. They have more than 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week. And with so much variety, you'll never get bored exploring their menus because they've got something to suit every taste and lifestyle. Once you've selected your recipes online, HelloFresh will literally give you everything you need to get it on your plate. Each recipe comes with easy to follow step by step instructions so you can try out new recipes without fear of it going wrong. 
HelloFresh understand that life gets busy. And so if you want to spend minimal time in the kitchen but are after maximum taste, you can try one of their quick and easy meals, like their fresh chicken tacos, which you can have on the table in 15 minutes or less. I've definitely got my eye on trying those. I just love how easy it is to switch up your meals without the stress of grocery shopping. In fact, HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. The recipes are simple and fun to pull together. And trust me, they taste so good, it'll still feel like a treat. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 grid and use the code 50 grid for 50% off. Plus, your first box ships free. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50 grid 50 and use the code 50 grid for 50% off. Plus, your first box ships free. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Dan, let's talk about you, technical director now. You've been in the job for a year. How different is what you're doing now to your previous roles in Formula One? So it, it is a bit more of a, a kind of overview in terms of a job. I mean, I'm having to, to sort of force myself not to get too involved in some of the kind of minutiae. I'm not the type of person that likes to, to micromanage people. I'm very much in favor of allowing people to, you know, to sort of explore the boundaries of their own responsibility and to kind of own their, their area. I've had to sort of take a, a step back away in some respects. You know, aerodynamics is my background and my passion, so I'm obviously very heavily involved in that and trying to sort of help define the, the shape of the car. What, what's different really is that this is an organisation which is growing at a rate of knots, both in terms of the people we have, but in terms of the organisation, what we're looking to achieve, how we're looking to introduce new processes and so on. And actually being part of that and being part of those sort of strategic decision-making discussions is, is the thing that's probably the most different. So that sort of overview and, and thinking strategically and into the future. What's the most important quality that a technical director needs? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a very good question. I don't, I honestly don't know. I think there are, I've met so many people who've ended up in technical director positions or are technical directors now that have a, a vast array of qualities. I think provided they work within the organization well, it, I don't think there is necessarily a blueprint. I'd like to think that I have my own, my own style of doing things, but it wouldn't suit everybody. Perhaps it wouldn't suit every, every other team on the grid either. So I'm not sure there's necessarily a, a kind of one thing that you need to be doing to be a good technical director. It's interesting, isn't it, how different teams are doing different things in this area. McLaren have just parted company with their technical director and they, they now have a triumvirate of engineers running things for them. Obviously, Red Bull have uh, Adrian at the top, Adrian Newey. Are you the de facto technical boss here? Does the buck stop with you? No, not at all. I mean... We like to discuss things and, um, you know, Mike is, uh, has a technical background, Mike Crack. He's obviously our team principal, but he does have a technical background and, and he, you know, wants us to discuss things in, a, in an open environment. So I can rubber stamp things in some areas, but essentially we, we make decisions as a team. We have a, a highly experienced and very skilled group of people in Tom McCulloch. Eric Blondin obviously came from Mercedes, Luca Fabato as well. So we've got some real talent there. And we, we like to try and make, particularly the, the sort of strategic or the important decisions, we'd like to make those as a group. Um, and as we evolve that kind of group of people, I think we become more effective. What about the 50-50 calls? <laughs> We're not sure whether to go left or right here. Is that when you step in? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I've never been shy about giving my opinion. So <laughs> um, if I feel passionate that we should go one way or the other, then I'll say so. And, and so far, I've found that you know, we are a very like-minded group of people. We, we can challenge each other. But, um, you know, if I really passionately believe we should do something, it generally tends to, to get accepted. You mentioned Eric. You mentioned Andrea Alessi. You mentioned Luca Fabato. What about Andrew Green? How much face time do you have with him now? A reasonable amount. I sit um, close to him in the drawing office. His focus is obviously a little bit different now. He's now sort of looking after aspects of the, the wider group so we have with Aston Martin an, an incredible opportunity to be able to to sort of broaden our remit across uh, different um, technical functions particularly in other areas of motorsport and and road cars and he's able to then take you know his experience and use that in the in the broader group we are obviously interested in what happens with this as a as a large company we're not just a formula 1 team you know we have engineering sort of businesses on the side of that as well now and these very strong links to Aston Martin Lagonda. So we do 
strategize about that. We do sort of think about how we can use that expertise in Formula One to sort of broaden the, the experience across the group. But, you know, that's very clearly his remit now. And, uh, you know, that's something he's really working hard on to sort of try and expand that in the future. His remit, not yours. I was wondering whether you'd be interested in a Valkyrie project, for example, <laughs> or, you know, sort of <laughs> following Adrian's footsteps. Well, just, it's yeah. something like that. Do you harbour those sorts of ambitions or is it very much F1 for you? It's difficult to see a car being developed, um, as I found with uh, Valkyrie as well, or any of the work that Adrian was doing. It's difficult to have a, a car like that being designed in the office next door and not take an interest. But I have to be conscious that, you know, my day job is very much F1, so I have to try and focus on that, which I'm trying to do at the moment. You've talked about how quickly the team has grown and I guess growing pains come with that. What can you do about that in terms of when you get a large group of people all coming together in a very short space of time? Is it is it lots of away days in the Welsh mountains uh, getting to know each other or what can you do here on site? I think the, the main thing that you can do, it sounds very trite, but really it's just focusing entirely on the communication. It's one of the things that falls over when you get confusion about people coming in it's the first thing that goes wrong is that people stop communicating in an effective way people become frustrated they lack the understanding of where the decisions are being made um, and that can cause confusion sometimes there are practical things you can do like sort of rearranging an organization chart or publicizing it to make sure that people know exactly where they are if the organization has changed but a lot of the time it's really getting the right groups of people in one room at the same time and, you know, letting them air their frustrations or talk about why things are challenging. And I think the other thing you can do is just sort of day to day, you know, speak to people at their desks, get groups of people huddling around a, you know, a workstation to look at things. And you you make that the sort of genesis of the team. And that, and that breaks down a lot of barriers because it, you know, we, we don't operate as an organization chart. You know, we don't we don't have hierarchies when we're in meetings. None of that is, you know, so that doesn't really exist in practice. It's just on a piece of paper. So how you interact with each other is very much how you behave day to day, in my opinion. So I believe you can break down a lot of barriers or get rid of a lot of frustrations by talking to people and also making sure that people are talking to each other. Um, because quite a lot of the time, that's the first thing that goes. And in terms of headcount, are you there now? Or are there still people on your shopping list that you'd like to join the team in the future? No, I think we're, we're pretty much there. I mean, we, we're always looking to what the, you know, the next version of um, Aston Martin F1 looks like. It's one of the things you asked about, what, what do you have to do differently? Well, one of the things I now think about is, you know, what's the team going to look like in a year's time or three years' time? You know, Lawrence has got a very ambitious target, but, um, you know, one thing's for sure is we won't look as the same as we do now in three years' time. So, you know, how, how are things going to change? But, you know, notwithstanding that, you know, we are in a good shape at the moment. We've got, I think, the right number of people. We may need to expand in some areas in the future if things change, but as, as it stands at the moment, we've got you know, the right people, the right talent. The main thing we need to focus on now is just getting the best out of people and making sure that we carry on the, the good work that we've done so far. You mentioned, what do we call him? The big boss, Lawrence Stroll, just then. <laughs> uh, how much time do you spend with him? What is his brief to you? He's a very present character. I mean, for, for somebody in his position who has you know, multiple businesses and lots of interest in all kinds of different things, um, he does like to spend time here. I think he's very passionate about this team, which is honestly one of the things that attracted me here in the first place. His passion? Oh, absolutely, yeah. He's incredibly passionate about Formula One. You know, obviously he has this very strong link to Formula One and this team with, with Lance as well. But he's just passionate about, about making this work. You know, he has this vision, which we all sign up to. And uh, and he you know he wants to see it being fulfilled in, in stages. You know, I'm sure he's in, in, as impatient as we all are. Stages, <laughs> to sort of uh, get tomorrow. There, yeah, I'll give you till he, tomorrow. He would like, yeah. yes, he would, I'm sure he would like to, everything to happen tomorrow. But he brings a huge amount of energy. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about new energy in this company. It's a, it's a sort of a phrase for us at the moment. And he is a big components of that you know he brings a huge amount of passion and energy and the fact that he comes here pretty much every week you know he wants to talk to people he wants to know how things are going he wants to you know challenge us about you know well what are we thinking about next and how are we going to sort of expand this how are we going to do that you know he likes to know that we've got a plan he likes to know that we're thinking about the future and how and, and also as he keeps repeating what can I do what can I do to help you know what do you need and that from you know our situation and mine in particular is is incredibly gratifying because that's exactly what you want from an owner. You want that that kind of motivation, that passion to sort of seep through the organisation. And you also want them saying, 
right, well, what do you need me to do? You know, what do you, how can I help? How can I, how and, can, and I can he help in ways other than financial? Uh, yeah, he can very much. His presence and his attitude and the way he interacts with people, the way he in, interacts with the media even, I think sometimes we underestimate that. The face that we put out to the rest of the world is hugely important for everybody who works here. You know, we've seen a huge amount of engagement with fans over the last year since I've been here. You know, that's grown exponentially as far as I can see. You know, I think we're the we're now the sort of you know the biggest we've got the biggest growth and engagement in, of fans in in the whole of F1 now, you know, and he's a key part of that as well. He's he's very much our our sort of front man, our voice. He's the figurehead at the top of the organisation. So the the way that he projects the the image of Aston Martin and what we're trying to do is incredibly important to everybody here. When you talk about motivation and passion, I do see similarities from the outside looking in, admittedly, between him and Dietrich Mateschitz. Would you agree? Yes. To be honest, I didn't have an awful lot to do with Dietrich Mateschitz, but on the, on the occasion I did, and certainly by reputation, I think they do share that sort of level of, of passion for the sport, which goes back many years. I mean, Lawrence has been involved in the sport, either peripherally or directly, for a, for a number of years. And, uh, you know, that, that sort of understanding of, of, of the highs and lows <laughs> of what, about what is, what's involved in, uh, in being part of the, the sort of great circus that we call F1, I think that's one of his strengths, you know, it's because he, he really understands the business. He knows that it's not, it's not all going to be great and glamorous and fantastic. Now, Dan, you know a lot about winning after your 15 years with Red Bull. Can we talk about them briefly? Just what makes Red Bull so good? So I think what makes Red Bull great is that they've spent a long time with a very clear direction. So ever since Adrian and Christian took over the team or Christian took over the team and then Adrian joined shortly afterwards, one of the things that Adrian brought to the team was a very clear direction in terms of what they want to achieve. So Dietrich Magistrix obviously put a huge amount of money into it and, and as we've said, was very passionate about Formula One and what he wanted to do with the team. But really all he could do um, was use um, Helmut Marco to make sure that the the teams they had were were working in the right way and that they had the drivers coming through and that you know what is now Alpha Tauri was used in the correct way to sort of further the cause. But really, it was a it was a question of you know giving money and freedom to the people who could then go about building a team like that. It's been a project for ever since Adrian joined, you know, and it's followed in you know his mold and his ideas ever since the the outset. What we as a management team when I was working there were, were really tasked with was making sure that we adhered to that vision whilst growing the teams in all the areas that we knew that we needed to grow in. You know, really, they've had the advantage of a very big budget, a very clear vision, being able to attract some incredibly good people, both as, you know, as graduates, but also from, from other teams throughout the years. And I think, you know, in latter years, they had the, probably the best head of aerodynamics. On, no, I'm not really <laughs> kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they did. But they did. We, you know, we produced a, a really functional, well-communicating team of really highly motivated and talented engineers with a tool set, which is the envy of the, the grid. So, And how much of what you saw there and learned there is transferable to Aston Martin? A huge amount. But equally, there, you know, I, I talk a lot about us doing things the Aston Martin way. Um, and one of the things I was very keen to do is not to try and replicate working methodology and the practices that we had at Red Bull. Even if we did, then we did them with eyes open. So knowing that that was simply the best way to do things for Aston Martin. And I'm, I, you know, I still absolutely believe that. We cannot beat teams like Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari by absolutely replicating everything they do. So we need to find our own way of doing things and we need to make sure that you know, in the years to come that they, you know, looking over the fence at us thinking, goodness me, how have they managed to achieve that? That's our aim. So yeah, I learned a huge amount from my time at Red Bull, but equally I'm having to sort of relearn things again because a lot of the, the techniques and things that I was using there are things which I'm now having to sort of criticise and say, well, I take it for granted that we did things a certain way, but maybe there is a different way of doing things. Did you always feel there was a glass ceiling? at Red Bull Racing in the form of Chief Technical Officer Adrian Newey and that for you to get a technical directorship in Formula One, you were going to have to go elsewhere? I wouldn't say there's a glass ceiling there. I mean, Adrian, I think is, you know, it's public knowledge that he's stepped back um, over the last few years. He's less involved than he was, but he's obviously still a, a huge presence there. But his influence is, um, it does define the way that the team works. But because he's not around as much, there is a certain amount of um, deferred responsibility to the people below him. But there's no doubt that there are a limited number of people there. Uh, you know, Pierre Wachet is currently the technical director. He's a hugely talented 
guy who does an in incredible job there. So whilst I don't think there was a glass ceiling as such because of the organisation, certainly, you know, somebody already in the job who I can't see that he's sort of going anywhere anytime soon. Had you been looking around for opportunities? I just think back to 2014 no. when McLaren came knocking. Yet that opportunity didn't arise. But was that when you sort of opened your eyes and thought, what else is out there? I've been, you know, incredibly lucky to not have to sort of apply for jobs in the past. I think as a, as a quite a few people who have relatively senior positions in particularly, and I think the sort of better performing teams will regularly get phone calls and inquiries from, from other people, from recruitment consultants and so on. And you have to choose how you want to deal with that. Well, if you're absolutely secure and, you know, and, and you've, you've signed up for a period of time and somebody offers you a job, which is reasonably equivalent or something, then you know, you're probably not going to be that interested. But there, yeah, there, honestly, as you can see from the fact that I'm here, there have been occasions where people have said things which are so interesting, even if it's at an inconvenient time, that you can't ignore it. And um, that's when, you know, you, you look to sort of explore them, I think. Right, let's go back now to the young Dan Fallows. You're an aerodynamicist by trade. You studied aeronautics and astronautics at Southampton University. Why did you choose aero? When I was, uh, actually, the strange, strange thing is I remember doing one of these um, online psychometric tests or, you know, what passed for online at, in those days when we were the, at the sort of career service at school. Um, one of the things it came up with is the, the number one thing that I should do as an aeronautical engineer, which I thought was incredibly specific. I don't know whether they're still that specific. I mean, a lot of them were like teacher, doctor, whatever, but... Aeronautical engineer was the first, which I thought was very odd. But anyway, so and I was thinking about that kind of course at university anyway, but really with a view to um, aircraft, um, because I, I thought, you know, aeronautics and aerodynamics and so on would be a, a very interesting thing to study, but really didn't think that motor racing was a big enough industry for me, me to be able to get into. So like a lot of people, I think, sort of originally came at it from the aircraft point of view. What, because of a, an initial passion for aircraft or, or, or the, is there flying in your family? And I'm immediately thinking of James Allison uh, yeah. just down the road at Mercedes, <laughs> whose father, I think, was uh, in the RAF and flew fighter jets and things. And James wanted to be that, but of course couldn't because of his, his colorblind. But was that a similar path for you? Not really. I mean, I didn't particularly want to be a pilot. I remember talking to Peter Padroma about this and he said the same thing that he got into it because he wanted to be a, a fast jet pilot. But uh, no, I, I didn't, didn't really ever hold aspirations to that. It was more just that I, you know, aircraft are extraordinary, but the, the engineering behind it was really the thing that, that kind of interested me. But having had a lifelong interest in cars anyway, and, and particularly Formula One, I just assumed that it wasn't it wasn't going to be possible. You know, I knew that there were a handful of people that worked on things like aerodynamics on Formula One cars, but you know, why on earth would I be able to do that? So went to university fully believing that that wasn't going to be an option. And then there was an advertisement for a, an internship at Tyrrell at the time, and um, I applied for that, didn't get it, and just thought, oh, well, never mind. And one of my colleagues at, at uh, university said, do you know what, I think uh, – you know, there are jobs in motor racing because when you think about it, there is Reynard, there's Lola, there's all these other, you know, Delara and so on. There's these other companies. There's more out there in motorsport than just Formula One. And maybe that's an in. So we talked about it a bit and decided that we would both write letters to everybody we could think of. Adrian Reynard, you know, all these <laughs> other people and just flood the market with CVs until somebody got bored enough to say, <laughs> yes, come and do an internship, which is effectively what happened. <laughs> At Lola? Yes, it was. Yeah. So I, I ended up speaking to to Jeff Willis at Williams and uh, and he put me on to um, Chris Saunders who was working at Lola at the time he they'd been colleagues at Williams in the days of Adrian Newey and so on and uh, yeah he put me in touch with with Chris Saunders who who gave me a job at Lola how receptive are formula 1 teams to graduates writing letters frantically i mean i guess you're always looking for for the next bit of talent so you take them quite seriously we do. We have times of the year where we are looking for graduates. So we have a, a much more structured graduate program than I think teams did back in the days when I was applying. I mean, it's one, one of the things that does give me pause for thought. And I remember talking to, to Adrian you about this a few times that the danger with our current crop of applicants is they're, they're so good. And they come from some of the top universities in the world uh, with, you know, exemplary results that I look at their CVs and think, you know, I wouldn't even get an interview now. <laughs> which, which, which could be a problem because, you know, there are, there may be people like, I wouldn't consider myself a diamond, but let's say, you know, kind of cubic zirconia in the rough 
of some of these people that, uh, you know, do we need to be taking straight A students and, you know, top graduates from the top universities? Maybe there are people who are, you know, would develop in this kind of environment that don't necessarily have those sort of academic credentials. But I suppose it's just the fact that we've got so many applicants now and it's the, you know, the competition. Is and so it's fixed. such a desirable industry it to is. work in. It has, now, now it's crazy. And obviously it's, it's a lot bigger than it was, you know, in the sort of late 90s. I mean, for every advert we put for graduates, we get thousands of applicants. Were you aware that by going to Southampton Uni, it actually already had quite a few links with Formula One teams? Or was that just a coincidence? Um, it was a coincidence. I thought it was a good university for aerodynamics, or they have this aeronautics and astronautics course. So you get to do a bit of space science as well. So you can claim you're a rocket scientist, which is nice. It didn't work, didn't work very well when you were trying to sort of chat someone up. But uh, I thought it would, but it doesn't, turns out. Uh, but yeah, that, was, that, that wasn't the main reason I went there, but it was certainly one of the, you know, it was a good university for that. I do remember having a conversation with one of the lecturers at one point when I said I didn't want to go into, into aircraft anymore. I was looking at motor racing and he said, oh God, like that tutee I had that Adrian knew he didn't he go off to do something in Formula One I said yeah I'd heard of him yes <laughs> and he didn't he do a project on ground effect while at uni which is he did. serving him in good stead now isn't it in fact on the topic of aerodynamics do you feel that aero is still the dominant factor in Formula One or are there now other areas eating into that it is still one of the main things that we have under our control to affect performance. I mean, we obviously have tyres are a hugely important aspect of the performance of Formula One cars. You know, we talk an awful lot about, you know, the performance of of the tyres during qualifying sessions, during the races. You know, it's a big feature of the outcome of races in terms of degradation and how the tyres behave. But in terms of the design of the car, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do that will will make sure that you are reliable, that you you know, you finish the race correctly, that you are not going to... I mean, reliability is a big thing, but uh, that also that your car is performant enough that it responds to setup changes. But the things that you can do from race to race that will make the car faster than, yes, aero is still by far the biggest thing that we can affect. And is there still room in the regulations for true innovation? And I'm thinking, I don't know, double diffusers in 2009, things like that. Not that well, bad example, probably, because I remember Red Bull being particularly unhappy about yes, that. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a sore, sore subject. But, but I mean, is there, do you feel there is still enough room? Honestly, no, I don't. Um, you know, we could spend another hour talking about the regulations and, and my feelings about those. But the regulations we have at the moment have, have been introduced with the, with the absolutely best of intentions and with, with a, a lot of very good research behind why we, we've introduced them. But you know, we now have a set of regulations that are by far the most complicated in the history of Formula One in terms of the length of the regulations, both sporting and technical regulations, and by far the most complicated to actually police. Uh, so the FI's job is exponentially harder than it has been over the last sort of few years. And I just don't think that's really been beneficial. I think it, you know, we have certainly, with as I say, the best intentions, tried to introduce regulations to improve the show. But... Uh, what we've effectively ended up with is a set of regulations that, that make you design a car a certain way. So the reason that a lot of the cars look the same or look very, very similar is that uh, the regulations effectively make you design a car like that. There's an incredibly complicated set of regulations for the front wing, for example, that are essentially making you design it in a, in a very particular shape. And we now have these regulations, not only are they complicated, but they can only be regulated or only be judged by the FIA by referring to CAD as well. So part of the regulations are, are literally how you constructed the surfaces that go into the shape that you've got. Whereas in the past we had regulation boxes, you know, and as long as the car complied to those, you could so you'd do So why are like. we still seeing so much diversity in, of performance? It feels closer if you take Red Bull out of the equation for a minute, but there is still quite... A difference between teams and if they're so prescriptive you would have thought we would have got a closer grid by now yeah you're absolutely right and i suppose that's the you know that's the counter argument to what i'm saying you know i mean I, somebody who's who's very keen on the aerodynamics i would far rather have more freedom i also think that you know cars that are very visibly different and not just in the side pod area is is good for formula one i think that's what the fans want to see and i think you know we've always identified you know even from the discussions we had about these regulations in the past that you know, it's not just a driver formula. People want to to watch a sport where the the cars are a differentiator. But you're absolutely right, and I can't deny the fact that there is certainly a difference in performance. The truth is that 
the differences between the cars are in you know, very, very small details, um, a lot of which are invisible. They're either actually under the bodywork or they're in areas of the car which are very, very difficult to see. And again, I'm not sure that, that having these very, very small details being the differentiator is really something we want to see. I would far rather, personally, see totally different cars that have wacky shapes all over them and new innovative ideas. But, you know, maybe, I accept that maybe that's just me. Maybe that's not something that, uh, you know, fans would want to see. But. Nice idea. But makes me ask the question, what do you enjoy most about Formula One? What I really enjoy is not necessarily the the sort of creating new surfaces for the car or new aerodynamic solutions, but it's seeing people coming together and actually generating new ways of working. So new ideas, new concepts, and then running with those and seeing the benefits of those, that, that I find the most rewarding thing. I remember James Allison in an interview talking about his sort of very light touch approach to management. And I, I think that's something I'd, I'd sort of aspire to as well. So pointing people in the right direction and seeing them sort of take these new concepts and run with them and really see the benefits of them, I find that incredibly rewarding. What about outside of Formula One? What passions do you have? Do you have any time outside of Formula One? <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have two children who uh, take up a huge amount of time, as you can imagine. I've, I always found that um, it's good to have something that you can switch off when you go home. So other than seeing the kids, which is obviously a really nice thing to be able to do. I, I've always sort of played music as a, as a hobby, not something I wanted to do in any, with any kind of <laughs> sort of professional level or um, to put any, any things out. But I've, yeah, I've always wanted to do that. So I play sort of piano and guitar and I have a, a studio at home and I you know, dabble around making sort of electronic music and things, which is... But I find it's just something that's sufficiently different that you can just switch your brain off and, and, and get involved and in that. And can you do that with the kids, with the wife? Do they all play, sing... Yeah, my wife has actually had these sort of hidden talent that she's an incredibly good violinist, which she kept quiet until my daughter started playing violin. And then she was sort of losing a bit of interest. And my wife said, well, you know, I'll dig out my old violin and play a bit with you. And it turns out she's incredible. So, um, yeah, oh, wow. so we are actually a musical family. As what well. a talented family, yeah. yeah and so and my... do, you collect, do you collect guitars? I don't know if you've got a fenders on the wall. Do you, you... do you know what I, <laughs> I do? <laughs> um, but, you know, don't have anything like enough time to play them all, so... I think I think it is a is probably a slight source of frustration to to my wife as to why we've got so many guitars hanging around when when I don't really have play them all that much, but they're objet d'art, aren't they? I feel there's definitely an opportunity for an F one band. We could have your missus obviously uh on the violin. <laughs> yeah. We could, we've got you on the guitar, we've got Leclerc on piano, maybe yes. Hamilton on guitar, Ricardo on vocals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, do I sound keen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't look keen. <laughs> but no, I did mention a few drivers' names then. And you've worked with many of the modern day greats, if I can describe them as that. You know, Vettel, Verstappen, now Alonso. What similarities do they all share? So they <laughs> they're definitely, they have that sort of ability to, to sort of add that extra couple of tenths to the performance of the car, which I don't really know where that comes from. That's a sort of raw talent. But the one thing that they are, all they certainly have in common is their ability to to describe how the cars behave and that's the thing that you know it's not unique to you know the greatest drivers that that we've seen but it's certainly something they all share is that sort of ability to get in the car and say with very great precision exactly where they could go faster if you change the behavior of the car and i think that's a really key thing i mean it, and it, i think a lot of drivers can explain you know how the car's behaving or you know well, i got a bit of oversteer here and a bit of understeer there and this is how the tyre changed and, and so on. But the really great ones, and um, it is a, definitely a, a common theme, are the ones who can say, do you know what? I've got understeer here, but to go quicker, I need you to fix this corner. I need you, I need this. That's that's the thing that sets them apart, I think. And how does experience help them? Because I feel you've got the, you're, you're in the perfect place to say how Vettel had changed from you know the championship winning years 2010 to 2013 to when you work with them again last year at Aston Martin. Yeah, he he was very similar. I mean, he he was a little bit frustrated when he left us at Red Bull. I think he felt the car wasn't, you know, wasn't as good as he was hoping it would be and and I think it wasn't just in terms of the pace we were all frustrated with the car, but he was a little bit frustrated with the the performance or his own performance in that car and how he struggled to extract the the good lap time out of it. And I think he is a very analytical driver. He's somebody who likes to to really understand how the car why the car's behaving in the way it does. And that certainly hasn't changed. You know, what we saw last year is is the same the same Sebastian really. He's a you know, still very analytical, still incredibly quick, but great to work with because 
he is incredibly communicative and, and he wants to understand, you know, it's not just about, you know, I want the car to go quicker here, but, you know, why isn't it? You know, what can we do about it? What are the things that we can tweak? And actually, I think with our with our current driver lineup, we are, they, they certainly have that that kind of ability as well. I mean, Lance is, you know, he's, he's got a laid back chap in many ways, but he's he's very passionate about what he does um, and he wants to understand why things aren't happening in the way that they, they should be happening or what we can do about it. But he is also very clear about how he can get things across to us in a way that we will we will get straight to the answer rather than it being a, a kind of compromise between one thing and the other. So, and I think he's learned from the drivers he's he's worked with as well. He's clearly got a great teammate in Fernando who can sort of show him the way with that as well. Um, and Fernando obviously has the, the same characteristics because he's able to be able to not only go incredibly quickly, very, you know, as soon as he gets in the car, but he's able to then describe, you know, how you could most effectively make the car faster. You're listening to F1 Beyond the Grid. So I'm guessing you think F1 is one of the greatest sports in the world. And here comes Max Verstappen to take the lead in both race. And the more you know about F1, the more you love it. F1 is everything. F1 is life. <laughs> That's right. But let's be real. There can be a whole lot to wrap your head around when it comes to F1. You saw those slot gap separators. There is a lot of science on these structures. Yeah, enough of that. We're here to help. Welcome to Formula Y. I'm Katie Osborne. And I'm Christian Hugill. And every week we're here to help find answers to some of those questions you've had about Formula One. We'll dive into what Formula One is all about, being joined by a team of experts along the way. That type of stuff, you can dream about it. Formula One driver during a race is going through extremes of heat, tension and water loss. We've got rare access to behind the scenes voices you won't have heard from before. This podcast will help you learn everything you need to know about the brilliant world of Formula One. Search your podcast app for Formula Y, hit the follow button, and get ready for our first episode. Welcome to Formula Y. How would you describe the Alonso factor? What's Uh, he got? What's uh, that guy got? (laughs) <laughs> well, he's just got a huge following. I think he's just not only is he incredibly talented, but uh, and he's and he's been around a long time. But he's he's now developed a kind of you know almost a sort of underdog status, you know, because I think everybody's aware that he should have had statistically a more you know, glittering career than he actually has had, which uh, you know for various reasons. But there's no doubt that he's a you know he is a world champion and he's a world champion level driver still is. There is a certain element of that that people want to see him do better. You know, there's this people riding 33 everywhere and, you know, there's... But his fan base is enormous, absolutely enormous. Has that uh, surprised you? Uh, it did surprise me a little bit because, you know, he's always been a driver and a rival team, so therefore I've automatically <laughs> wanted him to do quite badly. But, you know, <laughs> it's nothing personal. <laughs> you know, he's a lovely chap. Uh, but, you know, when he came here, the, the buzz around the place was, it was incredible. I think the fact that he doesn't take himself too seriously plays very well with a lot of people, you know, in the business. I think it, it does with the with the fans as well. What surprised you about Fernando Alonso? Just the level of passion that he he still has, um, having been around the sport for a long time. You know, he, I mean, he said himself he's been in the sport longer than he's not been in the sport. To have the the level of dedication and passion and interest, and you know, wanting to be involved in in every aspect that he can as a driver, and wanting to to drive us as a team, that that level of energy is just extraordinary in in somebody. And that rubs off on Lance, on you, on yes, everybody. Absolutely, yeah. As right right from day one, you know, he's just uh, come in like a sort of you know like a Tasmanian devil, and, <laughs> and we've we've all just sort of kind of reacted to it. It's. Um, but it's a great boost for us as a team. You know, we, last year was a very difficult year and, and all of these things that have helped to, to lift the team to bring that sort of new energy. And he's, he's a big part of that. Talking of his passion rubbing off on people, I feel that we're seeing a slightly changed Lance Stroll this year in terms of passion. I thought the hunger he showed coming back in Bahrain after his training accident, he seems almost more communicative uh, in the media. Would you agree? Do you, do you see any change in him? I mean, I haven't known him that long. You know, it's only been sort of around a year. I, I wouldn't say I'd seen him change that much. I think perhaps it's more the, the public perception of Lance that's changed a bit. People's perception of him perhaps isn't fair in terms of his his passion and dedication to things. As I say, he, he is quite a laid-back chap in many respects, but that sort of belies a, a person who is incredibly passionate about what he does. He's, he's knowledgeable and, and informed and very, very driven to be a better a driver overall. And I think there are 
a number of races that we saw last year. And, and when you look back even further than that, but there are examples of, of his racecraft, which I think is extraordinary. He consistently starts extremely well because he puts a lot of effort into making sure that that's, that kind of thing is nailed. He's a great racer. And, uh, you know, what he went through at the beginning of this season to put in three very solid performances under the circumstances was, you know, a testament to his character. So I think we shouldn't underestimate that, you know, he is a, a driver who's incredibly fast, who has a great deal of determination, a lot of talent and, uh, you know, and, a, and really a sort of passion to be involved in the sport. So I don't think it's a real a real surprise that pe as people get to know him and, and as our team becomes more visible, we, you know, there, we get more engagement with with the fans and the media that people get to see the, the real Lance. And I think, you know, people will really enjoy that. So let's throw it forward to the rest of this season. First of all, will you be disappointed if you don't win a race in 2023? No, not at all. We've always said that we wanted to make a, a step forward from last year. And I think we've done that. And to be where we are now is, is, is great and a massive boost for the team. But as, as I've said before, the really important thing is that this kind of jump in performance is sustainable for us that we can enter the development race with the the people of the likes of mercedes and, and ferrari and red bull and that we can you know fight with them toe to toe in the development race as and do well you think as, you can do that because obviously you've seen yeah, how red absolutely. bull do yeah absolutely i believe we can you know we're, we're certainly not the team that we want to be in three years time we've got a lot of things that we need to improve and and do better but you know we've shown that we can put a great deal of performance on the car in a, in a relatively short space of time. I think perhaps the thing that you know gets lost in the in the jump in performances last season is the improvement we made through last year. You know that demonstrates what we can do in the development race. That's what we need to keep going forward. So you know there aren't, aren't any excuses really. We can still do things with the tools we've got. And then once we have improved, then that's where we look to start challenging for race wins. So no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't be disappointed if we don't win the race. I mean, it'd be lovely, but. <laughs> and uh, is there one particular race this year where you think, yeah, if the stars align, that track should suit our car? Well, I, I mean, Monaco is always a good one, isn't it? Because if you manage to put in a, a good performance and qualify, and it's a bit of a leveler in terms of things like um, top speed, which we you know it's, it's pretty well publicized that that's not, not our, not our biggest advantage. I mean, you've got Red Bull are always seem to be sort of quite close to the top in terms of the speed traps and so on. That neutralizes that to some extent. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's a it's a nailed on win for us, but I think, you know, Monaco is always a little bit of a lottery. So yeah, that's probably a yeah. good chance for us. We love a bit of jeopardy, certainly. Yeah. Um, and do you believe in luck? I do. I do believe in luck. I mean, I think if I look at my, my career to date, a lot of what I've, if I can sort of say that I've achieved something in this, in this business, it's a huge amount of that is down to luck. You have to have a certain amount of ability and you have to be able to get on with people. I think that's a really important thing. But but honestly, being in the right team at the right time, taking the opportunities when they arrive, I would say that is a combination of luck and judgment. So I can't deny that the reason I'm sitting here talking to you and that you're interested in talking to me, which I still find extraordinary. But <laughs> the, the reason that I'm here is because, you know, is, is down to a healthy dose of luck. Well, you make your own luck. I'm sure of that. But look, my final question to you, I want to throw it further ahead. Can a team win the world championship without a works engine? Do you need for 26 and beyond to have your own engine? I think there, there are several reasons why it helps to have a works engine. There are elements of the rules which are, you know, slightly favorable for people who've got a works engine deal. I think that's just the way that things have panned out, probably unintentionally. I don't think it's impossible by any means. I mean, I think if I look at the power unit that we have from Mercedes, I mean, we, we also have their gearbox and rear suspension and so on. None of that I see as a, as a problem for us. I don't think any of that's holding us back. I think they have a, a very good power unit. It's shown itself to be powerful, reliable. They are able to develop it and still stay toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other power unit manufacturers. They have a, a huge amount of experience with their, their gearbox and you know, obviously their rear suspension design is, is what we're running and we're very happy with it. So I don't think there's anything that's stopping us achieving what we want to achieve with, with that power unit. Would it be preferable for us to be the, the works team? Well, yes, it would. But as I say, the margins are, are fairly small, really. Well, Dan, thank you very much for your time. It's been great to speak to you. Thank you so much and best of luck. Oh, thank you. Thank you.
I really enjoyed speaking to Dan. I only spent an hour with him, but I can already see that he's a great communicator, a man with a light touch, who must be an inspirational character to work with. There are a lot of takeaways from that chat, not least the thought of Alonso as a Tasmanian devil. And I'm already looking forward to Monaco to see what the team can achieve there. There are exciting times ahead. Dan, many thanks for your time, and I look forward to seeing you at a race again soon. Now, please send in your thoughts and stories about Dan. Have you ever worked with him? What do you think of the job he's doing now at Aston Martin? What did you think of our chat? Let me know through all of the usual means. I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter, or please use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid, and I look forward to hearing from you. Which, of course, brings us on to what you sent in after last week's show with Yuki Tsunoda. Many of you were impressed by what Yuki had to say, as was I. So let's start with this from Lindley Jones. Wow, Yuki has matured so much. So interesting to hear how willing he is to learn from others and see how much he's developed. Go, Yuki. (laughs) Well, Linley, thank you. He really has developed, hasn't he? And a willingness to learn will stand him in good stead going forward. And what about this from Will Williams? I absolutely love Yuki's personality, both in and out of the paddock, his honesty towards growth, How he improves on the track and his relationships is so eye-opening. Such a great pod. Well, thanks for that, Will. And you're clearly another person Yuki's impressed this year. Go, Yuki, indeed. And finally, let's hear from Tim O. Tim O with four O's at the end. That story about Yuki's father, Alonso, and the helmet swap is just so awesome. Thanks for that, Timo. It really is, isn't it? When we see Yuki and Alonso battling together on track in the future, we're going to have to view it in a whole new light. Look, thanks as ever to everyone who wrote in. We read all of your messages and we love doing that. But we're going to have to leave it there for this week. Just please remember to send in your thoughts and stories about Dan Fallows in time for next week's show. Well, that's almost it from me for this week. Please remember to have a look at the latest episode of F1 Nation, which is out now. Natalie Pinkham and myself look ahead to the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. We're joined by James Allison, who's returning as technical director at Mercedes. And we also speak to Alpine team principal Otmar Safnauer. That's available now wherever you listen to your podcasts, as will Formula Y, a brand new official F1 podcast all about how the sport works. Episode one comes out this Friday, the 28th of April. So please search your podcast app for Formula Y to listen to the trailer and to follow the show. Thanks for listening. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.